MotoGP bikes dominate every closed circuit on the planet. They're faster, more powerful, more technologically advanced. But there's one place where these quarter million dollar prototypes would get absolutely destroyed. The Isle of Man TT here, production-based world SBK machines consistently embarrass their MotoGP cousins. And the reason why will completely change how you think about motorcycle racing. Section one, the Isle of Man, TT context. The Isle of Man TT isn't just another race. It's 37.73 miles of raw, unfiltered terror carved through public roads that were never meant to see speeds above 130 miles per hour. This course features 219 corners, not the smooth, predictable turns of Mugello or Catalonia, but tight village streets, sweeping mountain passes, and blind crests where one mistake means hitting a stone wall at racing speed. Riders maintain average speeds between 131 and 136 miles per hour for nearly 20 minutes non-stop. Think about that. 20 minutes at highway speeds through villages, over bridges, past lampposts and trees with zero margin for error. The elevation changes alone tell the story. Riders climb 1,450 feet up Sneefell Mountain, where weather can shift from sunshine to fog in seconds. The death toll? Over 265 fatalities since 1907. That's not a typo. This is objectively the most dangerous motorsport event on Earth. Even MotoGP riders, the bravest athletes in racing, openly admit TD competitors are on another level of insane. But here's the crucial detail. The bikes used at TT are production-based machines similar to World SBK specification. With these are modified street bikes, not pure prototypes. And MotoGP bikes, they've never raced here, not once. The regulations won't allow it, and for good reason. Modern simulations and telemetry analysis reveal a shocking truth. If you forced a MotoGP bike to compete at the Isle of Man TT, it would fail spectacularly. Not because it's slower, but because it's optimized for an entirely different universe of racing. Section 2, MotoGP Prototype Characteristics. Let's talk about what makes a MotoGP bike so special and why those same features become fatal weaknesses on public roads. These are 1,000 cc prototypes producing over 280 horsepower at 18,000 RPM. They weigh just 157 kilograms, lighter than most people's luggage. Every component is bespoke, handcrafted engineering perfection designed for one purpose, going as fast as physically possible around a three to four mile closed circuit. The brake systems are carbon ceramic discs that operate between 600 and 800 degrees Celsius. At these temperatures, they provide devastating stopping power. A MotoGP bike can decelerate from 338 kilometers per hour to 65 kilometers per hour in just 293 meters. But here's the catch. Below 200 degrees, these carbon brakes are almost useless. They require sustained, repeated heavy braking to maintain operating temperature. The suspension systems feature semi-active technology with over 200 adjustable parameters. Engineers spend entire practice sessions fine-tuning compression damping for specific corners. This precision works perfectly on smooth, predictable tarmac, on bumpy public roads. It's like bringing a Formula One car to a rally stage. Then there's the aerodynamics, the real killer. Modern MotoGP bikes generate approximately 70 kilograms of downforce at 350 kilometers per hour. Those wings and fairings aren't just for show. They keep the front wheel planted during hard acceleration and create stability in high-speed corners. But downforce always comes with drag, massive amounts of drag. That aerodynamic package that makes the bike glued to the track at Phillip Island becomes an anchor at the TT. MotoGP uses Michelin slicks optimized for 65 to 70 degree lean angles and specific operating temperatures around 100 degrees Celsius front, 120 degrees Celsius rear. The tires work brilliantly when pushed to their limits on smooth circuits, variable surfaces, inconsistent temperatures, and unpredictable grip levels, not in the design brief. Finally, there's the fuel tank, exactly 22 liters. That's regulated, non-negotiable. For a three to four minute sprint around Mugello, it's perfect. 
For 37.73 miles of the TT, it's a mathematical impossibility. Section 3, World SBK Production-Based Characteristics. Now let's look at what production-based World SBK machines bring to the table. These bikes use 1,000 CEC production-derived engines, making 220 to 230 horsepower with rev limits around 15,000 to 16,000 RPM. That's 50 to 60 horsepower less than MG. But here's what matters. They make significantly more torque in the mid-range. While MotoGP engines scream at stratospheric RPMs, SBK engines pull hard from 3,000 RPM all the way to redline. The brakes are steel discs with traditional calipers. They're not as powerful as carbon brakes at peak performance, but they have one critical advantage. They work consistently from ambient temperature all the way up to 600 degrees Celsius. There's no warm-up phase, no operating window to maintain. They just work every time, regardless of conditions. Suspension is standard adjustable systems from Orleans or similar manufacturers. It's sophisticated, but not as cutting edge as MotoGP electronics. This creates a much wider setup window and more forgiving behavior over inconsistent surfaces. Aerodynamics are minimal. World SBK regulations heavily restrict winglets and aerodynamic devices. This creates less downforce, but crucially, far less drag. The bikes cut through air more efficiently, conserving fuel and maintaining higher top speeds on long straights. Pirelli provides World SBK slicks with wider operating windows and better compliance over varied surfaces. They're designed to work at multiple tracks in different conditions across entire race weekends, not just optimized for one perfect lap. Weight is 168 kilograms minimum, 11 kilograms heavier than MotoGP. That extra weight, counterintuitively, provides stability on rough surfaces and during elevation changes. And that fuel tank, 21 liters minimum, with teams often running 22 to 24 liters in endurance configuration. These bikes are designed to run 200 to 300 mile endurance races. 37 miles is nothing. Section four, why production bikes beat prototypes on streets. This is where physics becomes brutal reality for MotoGP bikes. Fuel management is the first executioner. A MotoGP bike carrying 22 liters would need to cover 37.73 miles at race pace. Simulations suggest they'd run dry around 25 to 27 miles. Remember, these engines rev to 18,000 RPM, push 280 plus horsepower, and overcome massive aerodynamic drag. Fuel consumption is catastrophic. Meanwhile, WSBK bikes with 21 to 25 liters and more efficient engines cruise through the full distance with fuel to spare. Brake consistency destroys the carbon advantage. The TT isn't about maximum braking power. It's about consistent, reliable braking for 20 minutes. Steel brakes maintain performance lap after lap, regardless of varying speeds and temperatures. Carbon brakes would overheat on long descents, underheat on technical sections, and cycle through their operating window constantly. One moment they're grabbing too hard, the next they're doing nothing. That inconsistency kills lap times and confidence. Aerodynamic drag is pure mathematics. That 70 kilograms of downforce comes with approximately 50 plus kilograms of drag force at speed. On a circuit where you brake hard, accelerate hard, and repeat, the downforce helps. On the TT where you're holding 180 miles per hour for minutes at a time, that drag is burning fuel and killing top speed. USBK bikes with minimal aero slip through the air like ghosts. Torque delivery matters when corner speeds vary wildly. MotoGP engines make peak power at 13,000 plus RPM, drop below 10,000 RPM, and they feel flat. The TT has everything from second gear hairpins to sixth gear sweepers. The USBK bikes with fat mid-range torque pull hard from any RPM, any gear. That flexibility is gold when you're constantly adjusting speed for varied corners. Setup forgiveness becomes critical over 37 miles of chaos. MotoGP suspension requires perfect settings for specific corners, specific temperatures, specific conditions. Get it wrong and the bike is a handful. USBK suspension has a wider sweet spot. It's good enough across all conditions. 
When the road surface changes every mile, rough cambers appear without warning, and elevation shifts constantly. Good enough beats, perfect but narrow. Tire pressure is a silent killer. MotoGP operates within incredibly tight pressure windows, often less than 0.2 bar between optimal and dangerous. Temperature and surface changes at the TT would cause pressure fluctuations that send teams into panic mode. USBK tires tolerate broader pressure ranges and adapt better to surface variations. Elevation changes expose weight distribution issues. Climbing 1,450 feet up the mountain, that extra 11 kilograms of USBK weight creates stability during steep climbs and rapid descents. Lighter bikes get unsettled by pitch changes, and with less aerodynamic drag, USBK bikes maintain momentum through elevation changes more efficiently. Section 5 Historical TT Winners and Data The proof lives in the record books. John McGuinness, the Morecam missile, has 23 TT wins and 47 podiums across 100-plus starts. He was the first rider to average over 130 miles per hour around the mountain course. Every single one of those victories came on production-based machinery, modified street bikes from Honda, similar to WSBK specification. Guy Martin became a TT legend not for wins, but for pushing production bikes to their absolute limits through the mountain sections. His lap speeds exceeding 129 miles per hour came from bikes you could theoretically buy at a dealership and modify. These weren't prototypes, they were production engines, production chassis with racing modifications. Peter Hickman currently holds the absolute TT lap record at 136.358 miles per hour, set in 2023 on a BMW M1000RR Superstock machine. Read that again, Superstock, a production-based bike closer to what you can buy than to a MotoGP prototype. He won three races that week on the same BMW. The bike proved its reliability, efficiency, and speed across multiple 37-mile sprints. Section 6, Why MotoGP Bikes Can't Compete on Streets Let's be blunt about why MotoGP bikes would suffer catastrophic failures at the TT. Carbon brakes become a liability. They require sustained high temperatures between 200 and 800 degrees Celsius. Street racing creates temperature cycling, hot on heavy braking zones, cool during long straights. The TT's mixture of flat out sections and tight villages would cycle brake temperatures constantly. One corner the brakes are on fire, the next they're barely working. Consistency dies, confidence dies, lap times die, aerodynamic setup becomes self-defeating. That 70 kilograms of downforce creates 50 plus kilograms of pure drag. On circuits, the trade-off works because corners dominate lap time at the T straight line efficiency matters more. Massive aero drag burns fuel, reduces top speed and overworks the engine for minimal cornering benefit. It's all downside. Fuel tank capacity is non-negotiable physics. You cannot fit enough fuel in a 22-liter tank to complete 37 miles at deep pace with a MotoGP engine. The math doesn't work. USBK bikes carry more fuel and burn less per mile. Simple equation, more capacity, better efficiency, mission accomplished. Tire optimization becomes a compromise nightmare. MotoGP slicks are designed for consistent track surfaces, specific lean angles, and narrow temperature windows. The TT throws everything random at tires, smooth sections, patched tarmac, manhole covers, painted lines, varying grip levels. Tires optimized for perfection struggle with chaos. Suspension stiffness punishes inconsistent surfaces. MotoGP suspension is rock hard and precisely calibrated for smooth circuits. Hit the bumps, camber changes, and surface irregularities of the TT and that suspension becomes a bucking bronco. Road racing demands compliance and adaptability. MotoGP suspension offers precision, but zero forgiveness. Electronic complexity multiplies failure points. MotoGP bikes feature incredibly sophisticated electronics, you traction control, engine braking control, anti-wheelie, power modes, all managed by advanced ECUs. More complexity means more things to fail when encountering mud, debris, 
temperature extremes, or moisture on public roads. USB-K electronics are robust and simpler. They're designed to work in varied conditions, not just perfect ones. Engine mapping mismatches the mission. MotoGP engines are mapped for three to four minute sprints with maximum performance every lap. The TT demands 17 to 20 minute sustained efforts where mechanical sympathy and efficiency matter more than peak power. Running a MotoGP engine at TT pace for 20 minutes would stress components beyond their design parameters. Electronics heat management fails in variable environments. Rain crossings, temperature gradients from sea level to mountain, varying air density. These conditions wreak havoc on sensitive MotoGP electronics calibrated for controlled environments. USBK systems are more robust and weatherproof because they're derived from street bikes that must work in all conditions. Conclusion, the Isle of Man TT proves an uncomfortable truth. MotoGP's engineering brilliance isn't universally superior, it's hyper-specialized on closed circuits with smooth tarmac, predictable conditions, and three to four mile lap lengths. Nothing touches MotoGP bikes. They're the pinnacle of motorcycle racing technology, but street racing operates under different physics, different rules, different demands. Uh, Production-based bikes win at the TT because they prioritize the right things, fuel efficiency over peak power, consistency over maximum performance, adaptability over precision. They're designed to work in the real world, not just the perfect world. If you forced a MotoGP bike to compete at the Isle of Man TT, you'd need to redesign almost everything. Different aerodynamics with less downforce and drag, different brake systems using steel instead of carbon, larger fuel capacity, probably 25 plus liters, completely remapped engine software prioritizing efficiency over peak power, different suspension calibration for varied surfaces, simplified, more robust electronics. By the time you finish those modifications, you wouldn't have a MotoGP bike anymore. You'd have um, a World SBK bike. That's why the TT remains the ultimate test of pure motorcycle racing. It's not about having the most advanced technology, it's about having the right technology for the mission. And for 37.73 miles of public roads, stone walls, elevation changes, and raw speed, production-based machinery is simply better. The best machine isn't always the fastest machine. Sometimes it's the one that can actually finish the race.